Good afternoon, procurement fans. Welcome to the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Today is February 27, 2018. My name is Justin Brannan. I have the privilege of chairing this committee, and I'm joined today by Council Members Barron, Rosenthal, Yeager, and Perkins. Um, today's hearing will provide this committee with an opportunity to evaluate the city's returnable grant fund, as I like to call it, the notorious RGF, a program administered by the Mayor's Office for Contract Services and the Fund for the City of New York that offers interest-free bridge loans to nonprofits on track to do business with the city. The Returnable Grant Fund was created in 1992 in order to support small not-for-profit businesses who could not afford to pay basic operating expenses while awaiting payments on their city contracts. In many cases, these small firms still rely almost entirely on city contracts for their livelihoods, with often 80% or more of their business coming from city procurement. While the Returnable Grant Fund was likely created as a stopgap measure to keep businesses afloat, it seems the situation has not improved at all over the last quarter century as we continue to receive complaints from city contractors about payment delays, long reimbursement schedules, and overall contractor dissatisfaction with the amount of time it takes to get paid. Let me be clear, this hearing is by no means intended to criticize the hard work done by many of the nonprofits and other small businesses that do very critical work for our city. Rather, the purpose here is to call into question the reasons behind these payment delays that make the returnable grant fund necessary in the first place. We as a committee understand that the procurement process involves several layers of review, not just by the Mayor's Office for Contract Services, but also by the Department of Investigation, the Office of Management and Budget, the Controller, and others. However, this fund has ballooned over the years with little oversight or even reporting on its most basic terms. For instance, we know that in FY16, the fund issued 912 loans at a value of $148.8 million. This was more than double the amount in loans from FY15. That data came from a small section in the 2016 Annual Agency Procurement Report. I say 2016 because 2017 report omitted the data on the fund entirely. Our concern is that a fund that was likely intended to be a small remedial measure has transitioned into a matter of standard procedure with little oversight, and that rather than addressing the underlying problem of payment delays, the mayor's office is institutionalizing a bridge loan program as a regular course of business. Since we do not know the current amount of money in the fund or the number of loans that are being issued, it's difficult for us to evaluate the returnable grant fund program at all or to determine whether it is, trying, it is tying up resources that might be better allocated in other ways. Again, we don't want to criticize the nonprofits and small firms that rely on these funds just to cover rent or keep the power on while they await payment from the city. We just want to make sure that the fund uh, program is being run as smoothly and as efficiently as possible and that it's not being used as a crutch to delay uh, repairing the city's broken contractor payment regime. With that being said, I would like to acknowledge that the committee is being joined today by the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and we look forward to hearing their testimony and answering some of our uh, questions regarding the RGF. Before I turn the floor over to the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, I'd like to thank my committee staff, uh, my legislative counsel, Alex Polinoff, um, policy uh, analyst, Casey Edison, financial analyst, financial analyst, Andrew Wilbur, finance union head, John Russell, as well as my advisor, Jonathan Yedin, for all their hard work in putting this hearing together. Uh, with that said, I will now turn the floor over to the administration for their testimony, if you would please Raise your right hand so Alex could sw can swear you in. I think I have to have all of you raising your hand. Thank you. Uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yep. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Brandon and members of the City Council Committee on Contracts. I am honored to be invited to your first hearing as chair and would also like to welcome new members to the committee. My name is Dan Simon 
and I am the Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and City Chief Procurement Officer. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Returnable Grant Fund and share information about MOX's role in supporting the nonprofit sector. I will also discuss relevant efforts to transform procurement. Human services accounted for nearly a third of the city's $21 billion in procurement for fiscal year 2017, and we have a duty to maintain the continuity of services for our diverse communities. Agencies and providers ensure vital services are available to New Yorkers year-round. For example, providers help young people to build the experience and the skills necessary to be competitive in today's workforce. They also ensure that older adults have access to nutritious meals and give families the opportunity to enroll children in stimulating educational programs at an early age. As an oversight and service organization, MOX helps agencies and providers navigate procurement rules and build tools to increase efficiency. The Procurement Policy Board is authorized to promote and put into effect rules governing the procurement of goods, services, and construction by the City of New York under chapter, chapter 13 of the Charter of the City of New York. The business processes stemming from these rules have historically been designed primarily to ensure compliance to maintain the public's trust. While measures to deter, to deter fraud and corruption are implemented, they can also slow procurement and financial processes. It is, it is within this context that we have maintained programs like the Returnable Grant Fund and launched new initiatives to in, introduce innovation and streamline contract administration. The RGF was launched in 1992 to ensure programs can start on time, even if contract review and registration steps are still in progress. Contract registration, a function within the City Controller's Office, allows the City to issue payments to providers based on acceptable delivery of services. The RGF is a, co a collaboration among MOX, OMB, and the Fund for the City of New York to provide short-term interest-free loans to providers. To be eligible for a loan, a provider must have a contract pending. A needs-based application process is required to access loans to cover critical operating expenses such as payroll, utilities, and rent. Agencies review and approve applications and perform responsibility determinations to advance the review process. MOX examines the applications for completeness and a approval is based on need and availability of funds. Following approval, the Fund for the City of New York executes a loan agreement with a provider and is authorized to issue the loan. Funds are generally available to the applicant within 24 to 48 hours of the fund's receipt of the approval from MOX. In fiscal year 2017, MOX processed 700 and 2017, excuse me, MOX processed 751 loans which in aggregate totaled $149.9 million, a value comparable to the prior fiscal year. This program serves as a safety net for providers, and the fund has grown over the years in response to the sector's needs and increased investment in human services programs by the administration. However, fixes are also needed to speed up procurement. MOX continues work to overhaul procurement by advancing technology, reforming dated policies, and eliminating burdensome administrative contracting practices. For human services, we streamlined and moved the request for proposals and financial management processes online through the HHS Accelerator System. We continue to introduce system improvements and launch new features to relieve providers and city agencies of transactional hardship. Accelerator's imp implementation refined and shaped our approach to digitizing the vendor disclosure submission process, formerly known as Vendex. For well over a decade, there have been calls to move Vendex online and simplify this arduous and cumbersome process for vendors. We've now done it. This past summer, we launched the first phase of the Procurement and Sourcing Solutions por Portal, or Passport. Vendors can now create accounts, file their required disclosures, and upload associated documentation in one shared digital space. As changes to key personnel or other information take place, providers can easily make and certify updates online a paper-driven and labor-intensive process that in the past would take upwards of a month is now being completed within a day for most vendors. MOX work closely with agencies and coalitions to phase in the use of, new, of the new disclosure process over the past few months. Today, more than 8,500 vendors have already created accounts with over 5,700 successfully filing. Accelerator and Passport represent innovation efforts which leverage, te te leverage technology to standardize process, remove paper-based burdens, and increase access to support and information, leveling the playing field for small providers and those new to doing business with the city. 
While these transformation projects continue, we also look for every near-term opportunity to introduce improvements and have created spaces for providers to guide our efforts. Through the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee, the administration collaborates with nearly 100 providers to further streamline the procurement and contracting process. Since launching in September 2016, the NRC has realized over 20 accomplishments that enhance cash flow, further decrease administrative burdens, expand organizational capacity, and create greater accessibility and transparency. Two relevant policy shifts will result, will result in better cash flow for providers. Starting in fiscal year 2018, providers will, were issued a 25% advance, which put cash in the hands of nonprofit providers earlier, and those payments are recouped later in the budget cycle. In fiscal year 2019, we will implement a streamlined budget modification process that offers providers greater flexibility. In addition, NRC initiatives clarified current contract terms, increased provider participation in program design, and improved audit coordination. We have made considerable progress and will build on these successes in the coming years, focused on near and long-term objectives. We look forward to continuing our partnership with the nonprofit sector to address emerging and persistent needs. MOCs will also continue to promote integrity, nurture efficiency, and ensure transparency and fairness. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to building a productive relationship with you and the contract committee. I'm joined by Ryan Murray, first deputy director at MOCs, and Victor Olds, our general counsel. We're happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Um, one thing I caught just in, in your testimony, the. Um, FY17 um, loans, so is that the first time I'm seeing that number anywhere? Because it wasn't in the report. That's pot potentially, yes. Yeah. So one, one thing that we did last year is we tried to streamline the, the annual procurement indicators report. Um, it was uh, sort of, it was lengthy, um, and there were many appendices that have the data in them. We can look back at uh, the, the data contained for the loan fund and make sure that that's provided to you. And we can look at that for the next year's annual report for sure. Okay. Um, I guess to there was, start- There was no intent behind not putting it in the annual I indicators gotcha. okay. other than streamlining the report itself. Um, what criteria, I mean, aside from, uh, I, one of the things you brought up was one of the questions I had, which was, to be eligible for a loan, a provider must have a contract pending. Is that their only criteria? Uh, to be eligible for a loan, right, you, you, you need to have a contract pending, but there are other facets to the application process. So what a, a vendor is go a provider is going to do is submit their application to the city agency that is holding the, that potential contract. Um, they're going to fill out a small budget that details the critical expenses that they need the loan for, typically uh, utilities, PS and uh, you know uh, payroll and rent, um, and then the city agency does what's called a responsibility determination, which essentially is a background check on the vendor to ensure there are no integrity issues that would prevent us from ultimately registering the contract. And so the eligibility is really around giving the city some assuredness that the contract will ultimately be registered. And once that application process uh, you know provides for that, and once that's done, um, then there's then the loan can be issued. Do we have a dollar amount of um, how much money has been lent in the current fiscal year? In the current fiscal year, I can uh, we can I can get back to you with that detail. That it's a number that fluctuates uh, every single day. What I can tell you uh, is that there is 68.7 million dollars in the fund itself, in on a on a rolling basis, and currently, again as of yesterday, there's 11 million available to lend. And, but so as, you know, as contracts get registered, the fund gets replenished. As applications come in, money goes out. So it's a, it's a moving target, that number. And where does that, six, the 68.7 million, where does that come from? It is uh, essentially, roughly speaking, half provided by the city and half raised by the fund for the city of New York from a private source. Okay. Is, do you have an idea, the last fiscal year, do you know how much was lent out? In fiscal year 17, it was the 751 loans for 149.9. 149.9, okay. Um, what, what about the, the default rate on the loans? Uh, is, there, the, is there a rate? Is that a rate that seems to be consistent year to year? 
do you mean uh, loans that are then are are not paid back? Is that what yeah. you mean by default? Yeah. So there are you know there are obvious challenges in the procurement process, and there are delays in, in registration that are unanticipated. When we issue a loan, we expect, generally speaking, that that contract would be registered within something like 90 days. There are things that arise in the contract development process that delay that contract from being registered. So default is not a word I would use because we, we just have loans that have taken much longer than we anticipated. And we are then, we still anticipate registering the vast majority of those contracts, and so there's just a delay. I wouldn't necessarily call it a default. But what happens if what happens if something falls through and then the, and then the, the you know they, they don't get the contract, but they've gotten a loan? What happens? So I would say first of all that by and large, virtually all of the loans that we issue, the contracts are registered and the amount and the, and the fund is replenished with those funds maybe one or two out of multiple thousand of lo uh, thousands of loans um, you think are, just one are or in two, that scenario, right? We, one or two per year? One, it, that's too much. I would say one or two ever. Okay. So generally speaking, it's close enough to registration where you are, the, the city agency and MOX is aware of anything that would potentially prevent this contract from being registered. And so where you're pretty, you're pretty close. It is a, it's, you know, it's, sometimes it's called the bridge loan because it's the bridge to registration. Um, but you know, in, in a rare case where integrity issues uh, you know, come up after a responsibility determination um, is completed, then there might be a, uh, you know, some uh, hurdles that we just can't get over. But again, in an extremely rare case. Is there ever a situation where even if um an entity is is in line to get a contract that you would reject uh, extending that loan? So the only reason I would reject, I mean, so I can't recall a rejection of any application for a loan. Um, if the need is there, then, you know, the, the loan is issued. Um, if sometimes, you know, if, if I can imagine a scenario where the contract is at the controller's office and registration is so close that a loan really wouldn't be uh, useful, then potentially, you know, we wouldn't sort of approve the application. That's a hypothetical. Um, but, uh, you know, rejecting the loan after the need is established and the eligibility is established is not something that we would uh, really. Uh... So I guess to zoom out, I mean, I, I, you know, I think, are, is this, is the RGF something that we would like to eventually not have in a perfect, like if procurement was working so efficiently, wouldn't the idea be then that we wouldn't need a returnable grant fund? In a, in a perfect world, yes. In a perfect world, this fund would not be necessary. But over the years, it's only gotten bigger and bigger. Uh, over the years, it has gotten bigger and bigger. As the, as, the, as the investment in the human services sector has gotten bigger and bigger, it is roughly one-third of all city procurement um, is, is human services. Um, while it is getting larger, I would say $68 million dollars as a safety net for four to six billion dollars in spend is, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it a, a crutch, um, but it is a safety net um, to allow for uh, the delays in the contract process. Um, okay, I will turn it over to Councilwoman Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, pleased to be on this committee. This is the first time I'm on contracts and look forward to working with the chair and the members going forward. Thank you to the panel for coming. I have a few questions. So you said there's $11 million presently available. That's uh, correct. For, what's the average size of a loan? I know there's a range. What's the range and what's the average size of the loans that you give? Uh, I don't have that particular math in front of me, but we can certainly get right back to you. What, uh, what I would say is it, it, it generally fluctuates based on the contract type. So What's the largest that you've given? I, I, I can get back to you on what the largest number, of the, the okay. largest loan we've given. And then what are the terms? When, are, when is this money expected to be repaid? How much so time do the, people have? The, the Fund for the City of New York executes a loan agreement with the provider, and essentially what happens is upon registration, instead of the agency issuing a payment to the vendor, it issues that payment to the fund that repays the loan. And there hasn't been any, op any instances where a person, where you've given a loan and you haven't, it hasn't been satisfied? 
again, out of the, the multiple thousand loans that we've issued, one or two. Very, very rare case. Well, how long does the application process take? I saw in your testimony you said that it, the money can be granted within 24 to 48 hours after it's approved. From the time that an application is submitted, how long could a person, could an organization expect it would take before they would get approval? So again, the application process begins with the agency, and so it's this, between the city agency and the, and the provider. And um, then once that application process is complete there, it comes to uh, MOCS, and then typically they're, they're very quick turnarounds. Between, uh, within 24 to 48 hours, they would have a, they would have a check in hand once um, MOCS approves the loan. But so depending on the application process and the vendor's ability to submit the application, you know, it could take, it, it's taken within a day. I can, I can say, you know, if there was a real critical issue and cash flow was needed, we've done it within a day if necessary. But typically I would say it takes, you know, days to a week. So a lot of these organizations are small community-based organizations and uh, they apply for grants and they get funded perhaps through a council member's office. How, who informs them of the fact that this system exists so that they can apply? Because most of them, the smaller ones, don't have cash on hand and they've got a, I know that they get reimbursed as they spend the money. Who informs these organizations of the fact that you exist and that your function is to give them a loan until such time as they're able to uh, get access to funds? So availability of the loan application is available online, accessible by anyone. Right, but who, how do they know that it's there? Sure. So we, we, you know, we're, we're not shy about uh, marketing this loan program, and neither are city agencies. City agencies rely on it as well. Um, typically, it'll, it'll happen while contract negotiations or contract development is going on in between the city agency and the provider. Um, but we also talk about it at, uh, at city council uh, trainings that MOX does. Right. Uh, Ryan, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Hi, Council Members. So, uh, Give us I, your name, please. Ryan Murray, First Deputy at Mayor's Office of Contract Services. Um, we, uh, as you know, at MOX, share responsibility for training folks on uh, capacity building, awareness of, of the discretionary process and how to go through that. So as a part of that training, if there's uh, an organization that's going through that process with after they're, they're designated on your side, uh, they're made aware of the loan fund. Um, so that's a training that's offered now three times a year uh, by our office in partnership with your team. Uh, so it's usually it's your, the team in your council's office. Uh, and that training is offered, as, again, three times a year. Uh, folks are made aware that the fund is available. Folks are at the agencies, um, again, as Dan said, aren't also shy about uh, letting folks know about this. So there are two channels. Thank you. You're welcome. Is there ever money left over, and what happens to the money that has not been awarded through a loan? So th the money is not used to award. This is, this is a loan that is expected to be paid back. So it's a, revolving, it's a revolving fund. And so the money that goes out comes right back. So it, and, it's, it's and loaned out to the, to, to the provider. When the contract is registered, the loan is paid back with essentially So the, the $11 first million dollars that you have, do you expect that all of that, do you always use all of the money that you have in your budget for loans? And if not, what happens to what money might remain? So depending on, you know, the procurement is very cyclical. And so at times when uh, contract registration is, there's heavy activity there, then you'll see that the, the use of the loan fund goes up. And then, you know, when there's a, when, when that activity goes down, then there's, there's more available. But the money does not leave the, the loan fund itself it is loaned out and replenished constantly. And so while we have 11 million available today, if a contract for a million dollars with, with a loan for a million dollars gets registered tomorrow, then we'll have 12 million available. So it's loaned out and replenished. So what is the highest amount that you've ever had in, in, your, uh, in your budget? What's the highest? Uh, I, we, I, we could go back and, and okay. do a trend report that will show you what's available over time. 
Right. Um, but ult but ultimately, it's 68 million at, at the moment. Although a, a large million. portion. So it's that. generally 68 million each. Well, year. 68 million is the entire fund. Is 56 entire is fund. loaned out. 11 is available. Is it ever more than 68 million? No. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The answer to that is not yet. Uh, Councilman Rosenthal. Thank you for that, and congratulations, um, Chair Brennan, for pounding the gavel much better than I ever did. Um, and thank you for having this hearing. This was actually the topic of my first hearing as well. It's important that um, I think the council understands the working of the returnable grant fund. So we really appreciate your guys coming here to explain it. And I'll be honest, every time I hear about it, I learn something new. It's not, it's not an obvious thing. Um, and I think uh, at the heart of what we're all trying to get at is making sure that the nonprofits we want to do the work has enough money to do the work. And um, you know, how do you do that given that a contract might not be registered yet uh, with, this, with the controller or with the city? Um, so I, I think the thing that it does, it is worrisome that you would consider taking out of the procurement report um, the returnable grant fund information. I understand that it's a snapshot, so it's not as valuable, but I actually would go in the opposite direction, and I think what would be amazing is, I mean, I'm gonna put it out there, but if you could see, a, pick a day over the course of a month, you know, maybe the last day of the month, and in the procurement report, report on the last day of January, here's how much money was given out, and here's where, we, here, you know, and this equals this number of grants. And in February, at the end of February, this is how much money is out, equaling this number of grants, so that we could, or the public could capture the seasonality of the grants. Um, you know, I mean, you know, me, I would actually love every day to see what's in there, which grants, and which grants take a long time to get registered or whatever. I mean, my biggest concern would be that there, today there might be $11 million, but it might be the case today that, you know, the controller is not registering a really big grant, mm -hmm. say, for a homeless services. Those are ginormous grants. And um, to the extent that the social service providers are not getting their funds to do their work because the contract's not being registered for whatever reason, you know, it could be that that contractor needs $5 million. At what juncture does Mox, you know, who's weighing all this, say, you know, we really can't give out five because we know we're gonna get a request for six next week and this isn't gonna be replenished. Um, you know, it's a real judgment call, I think, all the time. And one thing that I had hoped would happen was that the amount in the returnable grant fund went up to 100 million. We know that service providers are not getting their money right away. And we know that it's a little bit complicated because maybe they haven't even gotten through the registration process yet. But I wouldn't, you know, it, my two cents unsolicited is not to walk away from this at all, but to go in the opposite direction. I think more um, places than we know need the money. I also am wondering, you know, in terms of timeliness, timeliness. Um, I was interested to hear that you're issuing a 25% advance to put cash in the hands of nonprofit providers earlier. That's of course great news, and of course we know that'll all be replenished to the city. 
or whatever, that the city won't be drawing down those funds. The provider wouldn't draw down those funds if they already got the advance. That's not part of the returnable grants fund. I get it. But we're, the hesitation is, are those, I'm guessing, those are contracts that have been registered with the, with the controller. That's right. So that's a problem, right? That's in many, you know, respects, that's, that means that they would have been, they're getting their money pro at least um, two months, would be my guess, earlier than they would have gotten it. So that's important and that's great, but, you know, um, I had always hoped it would even be before it registers with the, um, with the controller, which I know is illegal, and you can't do that um, because you have to know that you're giving it a con giving them a contract, and you need that assurity. But isn't you know I would ask again, isn't there some place in that uh, process earlier than it getting registered with the controller, where you could contemplate giving that 25 percent? I mean, once it gets registered, you know that you've got the contract and you can start drawing down the money. Well, what I will say is that it, it is not just one clarifying detail, is that it's not just 25% when the contract is registered. It's a policy that stands for every fiscal year. And so if I'm in a multi-year contract, every July 1st, providers would get a 25% advance of cash, right? And so with all of their city contracts, they would be eligible for 25% to have cash on hand on July 1st or you know, yep. very soon after July 1st. And so that allows them to have a, at least positive cash flow for those programs for the first three months of that registered contract, yes. But it wouldn't just be a one-time advance, it would be every single fiscal year. They would be issued 25%. And so, and then we would, we've also agreed to not recoup those advances yeah. until the second part of the fiscal year to allow the cash flow to sort of remain, uh, 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 you know. Uh, Why would you ever recoup? If you're advancing, it's advancing for services that they're going to invoice sure. you for. So would an, yeah, an advance is an advance without an invoice, essentially. Yeah. Right? And so I'm, I'm giving you the cash up front, and then depending on the contract terms, you're then, the provider is then telling us the expenses that they incurred, and then we recoup that advance through an invoice. And then pay them by a... So essentially, we're, we're issuing the, the, the advance without an invoice. So they're not telling us that they've incurred expenses. We're giving them of a, of a hypothetical $100 contract. We're issuing them $25 up front. Right. So over, the course they... of, over the course of the year, they're going to tell us that they expended $100. I'm only going to pay them 75 more. Of course. Right. But and you're so that, not that's asking I mean. them to give back the 25 cool. before you not give at it all. again. But, oh, okay. But we recoup, we recoup the advance in the second half of the year. That was, a, that was an issue for providers that they would, you know, upon an advance, it's immediately in September, it would start being recouped, and we've moved that to the second of half of the year. Okay. Good. Just in an effort to, you know, so support nonprofits. So that's helpful to the well. multi-year contracts. That makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense for providers who are the big guys. You know, it, I, I don't, I'm not sure how it helps the city council discretionary, um, if it does at all. Would it, I mean, maybe it would be interesting, would you be able to cull out of the uh, returnable grant fund those that are for council discretionary projects? We could certainly, yeah, we can come back to you with that. That would be an interesting annual number to add to the procurement report, given that the council is most worried, yeah. of course, about our own providers. Yeah, I mean, the trouble with the discretionary process, as you well know, is that these contracts are retroactive almost by definition because they're, the vendors are identified as the budget is adopted and the contract start date is July 1. And so you're, you're late by definition in the discretionary process. And right, but hypothetically, is there a way for those organizations to get a 25% cash advance, given that they've already gone through a number of clearances by MOX and by the city council before they even get into um, the Schedule C adopted budget? 
So not the advance, because the advance would be on a registered contract. Mm -hmm. But if the contract was not registered, however, it was pending registration, mm -hmm. and they had passed all of the clearance processes you know, uh, by the council and by MOX, then we could issue a loan from the returnable grant fund. That's remarkable. It is, yes, which is free. No, please. Um, <clears throat> that would be an interesting policy to explore. Do you think that would be hard to do? Well, it's not a, it's, it's. Now you're really it's, sorry you said it. No, it's again. not a, it's not a, it's, it's essentially, or the policy is already there. The difficulty is getting discretionary awards registered in a timely fashion. Right, and if you if they got a loan, though, that would help. E even even the vetting process, right, uh, be between the council and the city side is is lengthy, um, and the you know the, the procurement process. It, it then even after award has to go through the, the the you know the contract registration process, the contract development process, right? Yes, registration is 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 at the end of that development process, but even developing the contract for discretionary awards can be lengthy. I just want to manage expectations that this does not mean that immediately in the, you know, in the summer after the budget is adopted that we could issue loans to all of the folks that uh, receive discretionary awards. Each, you know, the, the, the vetting process for discretionary awards is a year-by-year -year, uh, Of course, activity. but if there were some criteria that could be met, and what I had thought was happening over the past four years as it's been explained to me, is that the council has changed its amount of rigor for looking at a nonprofit to make sure that's getting the funding, to make sure that it passes certain tests before it can even go into the budget, much more so than was the case four years ago where that additional process would have taken three months. We now condense that it cannot go into the budget. So it might be worth pursuing for our sake, um, actually, money, you know, s starting in the last two weeks before the budget is adopted, returnable grant fund, that process with these nonprofits. I, I'm, we'd be happy to explore that uh, with council finance and. That'd be great. So between, um, what, do you happen to know in your documents for 2015 the number of returnable grant fund loans? The number 15, of fiscal year 15. Fiscal year 15 was 765. Oh, so 765 in 16 it went up to 912 and then down again to 750. I was wondering if there was a pattern maybe going back a year or two prior even um, that might correlate with the new use of accelerator or passport and whether or not those things expedited um, contracts so that we wouldn't need the returnable grant fund. So I would say that I, I would say that it corresponds if there's any pattern or it corresponds to the investment in the human services sector. Um, there's certainly been an increase in uh, this administration's um, efforts in, in human services and, and I think it reflects uh, that. Uh, that increase. Um, in terms of accelerator and passport having an impact, what I would say is, and, and you know uh, uh, HHS accelerator very well, it does not control the, it does not manage the process end to end. Um, accelerator manages the, the, the competitive process of a for a request for proposals, and it also manages uh, the budget invoice and payment processes for registered contracts. Um, those are two portions of the procurement process and not end-to-end. -end. Um, Passport, on the other hand, is intended to be an end-to-end -end, uh, procurement system of which we've uh, released phase one of three. And phase one was replacing the antiquated Vendex system, which was internal only, not available to providers. Um, and so now, you know, with uh, release one uh, gone live and some uh, 8,000 vendors already in, we're now moving on to uh, designing release two and release three and other future phases of that project. How many vendors, and I know this is not the topic of the hearing, how many vendors ultimately are you shooting to get into Passport? 
So at any, at any, uh, at any given time, active contracts, we think the number is roughly 10,000 vendors that have active contracts at any time. Again, it's a number that fluctuates. Contracts end, contracts start. Um, but roughly speaking, there's 10,000 vendors that have contracts. Um, and so I think you know, what we're trying to do is not just get the, the vendors in that ha do business with the city, but you know, the purpose of uh, many of our systems is to level the playing field, demystify city government and city procurement, and invite uh, other providers that have never done business with the city before, right? Um, and so I th we, we, we have an upper bound uh, figure of like 20,000 vendors that ultimately would be uh, in passport, we think is the right number. Including then construction, human services. That would be all industries, professional. yes. That's right. Do you have a date that you're shooting to get all 20,000 in? So we have uh, release two and release three. Release two and release three will be will will be launched over the next couple of years, um, but because uh, the uh, the release one of Passport houses what used to be called Vendex, any any providers that must come in and provide those and file those disclosures, we're not, you know, we're not too worried about them. They're going to find their way to the system because they must do it. Um, we have been, you know, we've been working on a slow launch, right, as the, you know, you, you never want to go with a big bang approach with a new system like this, especially citywide, because you want to make sure you get the kinks out. We've got 8,000 uh, vendors with accounts and nearly 6,000 that have gone through the filing process, and so it wasn't as soft as we wanted the launch to be, but it's, you know, uh, we're getting there. Um, and so I think over the course of the next few years, we would reach those numbers. That's the target. Congratulations on that, by the way. Right. Um, yeah, I never actually understood the difference between Accelerator and Passport, so I'm very happy to turn it over to Justin now. It's exactly the right time. Um, it, it does strike me, though, that we're not quite there yet. There are still, I, from what I hear, more vendors out there who, who could use the returnable grant fund um, who may not know about it. Do you think that your ACOs, are all of your ACOs, by the way, trained for the accelerator and passport in all agencies? Absolutely. So it, we, have, we have trainings. Uh, uh, on a rolling basis on Accelerator and Passport. I think we had the number for Passport is 1,500 staff since August um, on, on the use of Passport. Again, you know, it's mostly on the vendor side, right? We wanted to make sure that we got to vendors to train them on how to use the system. I think the good news is that most of them are using the system successfully without actually coming in for an in-person training. They're taking our materials that we have online that are step-by-step -step guides on what they need to do and uh, in a self-paced way is, are, are achieving what they need to achieve in the system. Mm -hmm. um, city agencies uh, have, are doing the responsibility determinations now in the system as well as performance evaluations and we have a variety of different ways in which we train. We have webinars, we also have materials, but then for folks that need that extra hand-holding, they're coming in personally and we're doing you know, uh, in-person training. So there's a variety of different methods to uh, train It'd be staff. interesting to sort of track that. And also, Council Member Barron's point about whether or not the, non the ACOs are really letting the nonprofits mm -hmm. know about the returnable grant fund. I think that's a constant challenge, especially if um, they're new discretionary yeah. awards. Um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe you have some thoughts on how to get the word out even more. But. What well, we'd be happy to uh, think with you about ways in which we can get to folks that might not know about it, where we definitely don't want to keep anybody away. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your indulgence, Chair. Uh, Councilman Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I wish to associate myself with your opening remarks about the, about the nature of the fund because, you know, we're, some of us are new here, some of us have been here a little longer. Um, and I'm concerned, uh, as the chair expressed, that you know we kind of have this this you know uh, rubber band and you know some scotch tape to try to fix what's obviously broken in the procurement process. I know you're not here to talk about the procurement process and what takes that long, but some of the questions I have involve that how that gap is or how that gap filler is actually working. So, for example, um, uh, you talked about that prior to your being uh, willing to give out a loan. 
Uh, you do some integrity checks. Uh, you make sure that essentially you get the paperwork to the point where it would be eligible for registration but for the fact that it's not registered. I know you don't register the contracts. I know, I know the controller does that. But my question is if we're at that point where you feel comfortable enough taking tax dollars and giving it out as a loan and to, the, to the point where you're so certain that you're going to give it out that virtually all of them, your, your words were virtually all and only maybe two have not been repaid over time. Um, so you're giving out this money. You know you're going to get it back. So they're kind of safe. They're very safe bets. They're not a bet at all. What's keeping those contracts from getting registered if you're able to testify to that? Sure. I would, I would, I would acknowledge that the, the procurement process is flawed. It is, it, is, it, is, um, it is filled with regulations, rules, and laws that have been around for a very long time and have built up uh, you know, a, a, a process that is not efficient. Right? Um, it, it requires not just technology, but it, it requires some business process reengineering as well. Um, right now, it is very sequential. Um, historically, it has been, you know, uh, this person looks at it, then that person looks at it, and then the next person looks at it. And that needs to change, right? Technology allows you to provide transparency to all three of those people to look at it simultaneously and then catch it when they're all done signing off on their respective piece. Um, and so, not that, you know, all of those rules are in place for very good reasons, right, and to, to ensure t integrity and fairness. Um, but there's a, there's a way to infuse some technology to improve um, the way in which it, it works right now. So that, that's one thing I would say about the procurement process. It is absolutely flawed, and that's what we're focused on. And so we're focused on long-term goals like Passport um, and Enhancing Accelerator, but we're also focused on the near term when there are issues that result in a contract not being registered. I could name some, but there are many, many different reasons why a contract might not be registered even though you know that you're working with a vendor that's in good standing and has no integrity issues, they've passed their, their responsibility determination, the, an agency feels comfortable doing a responsibility uh, determination on that vendor, and they expect that contract to be registered, but it could be a whole host of reasons right. why that registration is delayed. But, but in fairness, the, the money that you're giving out, we're not talking about contracts that are in danger of not being registered because you've sort of created this, uh, this parallel path of of an unofficial registration, if you will. I, I know we're not calling it that, but they're essentially, but for the fact that they're registered, they're not registered, they kind of are because you're giving them the money and you wouldn't if you didn't think they would be registered. So it's kind of like a parallel uh, unofficial registration, if you will, within your fund. Am I describing so, it right? So we're, we're comfortable enough that the contract will ultimately be registered. The way that, the way that uh, you know, the city uh, the, the systems that uh, issue payments, right? A contract cannot be, we cannot issue a payment on a contract that is not registered. And so recognizing that fact, we think that this is a, a usable safety net for the nonprofit sector to ensure that they have cash flow in when there are delays in the contract registration process. As, as do we, we believe that it's, uh, we believe that the same. Um, just uh, to, to follow up on uh, Council Member Barron, Council Member Rosenthal's questions about the smaller agencies that we're talking about, because for the most part, you're talking about those, you know, big $800,000 contracts, whatever, um, and they have, for the most part, I guess, rolling contracts, because obviously if it's a new contract, you're not there yet, you can't really give them the money, but if it's a rolling contract, you know that the contract's going to be there, uh, you know, FY. A, FYB, FYC. So by FYB and C, you're just able to kind of, uh, you know, keep it moving if they haven't gotten that 25% and if they need that extra help, right? So the new policy would be that on that multi-year contract that I think you're describing, each July 1st, as the new budget uh, becomes available, they would be uh, eligible for a 25% advance. And, and so each, so at the beginning of each fiscal year, city agencies, provided that it was uh, the, the only circumstances where it wouldn't be eligible is if, you know, sometimes some federal funding streams don't allow advances, right? But, but under normal circumstances, each, the beginning of each fiscal year, the city agency is issuing a 25% advance to that uh, vendor for that contract. And if they're getting the 25% advance on the contract, they're not going to get a loan from you? It wouldn't be necessary to, to issue a loan because they've got a registered contract. And you've, you will only do a 25% Payment or how much would you give on a, on a contract? How much would you advance on it? How much would you loan on a contract that's not registered? I guess. 
Well, the, the loans are, are based on need, and so the application is coming from the vendor. They're describing to us what their critical expenses are. Um, they work that out with the city agency, and then, and then you know, the, what, what might be negotiable uh, is, you know, instead of three months, if they're requesting three months of critical expenses based on the availability of the fund, we might only issue one or two. So that was actually my next question. Do you ever knock them down a little bit? They come in and say, you know, we need, to, we need the, this bridge for three months. Do you come in and say, you know, you're asking for $50,000 for three months, we'll give you $35,000 to cover you for two months? That will occur at times, yes, depending on the availability of funds. All right, I, I wanted to talk about uh, uh, Passport for a moment. Um, your testimony, you indicated that, uh, sorry, I believe you indicated, maybe you didn't, uh, that you have 8,500 vendors currently, I'm trying to find where you said that. They have um, accounts. Uh, there's 8,500 vendors with right. accounts and about 5,700. 5, so 8,500 vendors have created accounts, 5,700 have successfully filed. Yep. I'm, I'm a recovering lawyer, so I look at every word. What is, so yes, that's, that's those of us who have licenses, but we can't practice anymore. What does successfully filed mean? It just means that they've gone through the, uh, what <coughs> folk, some folks know as the old Vendex process. So essentially, based on the amount of funds that a, that a provider is receiving from the city, they're required to file, it, before Passport, they were required to file Vendex disclosures. And so it's a, a various questions that are related to their background and their affiliations. Um, and so, and so 5,700 are those that have gone through and submitted all of their disclosures. But is there an unsuccessfully filed number? No. Okay. No, so it, it's just, it's just the, the delta is folks that have accounts who haven't yet uh, gone through the okay. filing process. And I, I believe uh, possibly Councilmember Barron asked this question about, uh, maybe not, um, about the number of people who, who have gone through this process. and. You know, it's, I guess, a small percentage of the number of contracts throughout. And, you know, when we're talking about the small and our profits, obviously, it's more complicated once you start to get, you know, they've been doing this paperwork for all these years, and now you've got to get them into the system. And uh, Council Member Rosenthal asked you if your agency chief contracting officers throughout the, system, throughout the city are actually actively, not just passively, but actively working to bring their contractees in, or their contractors contract yours, something, uh, into the system so that they know that they should do this because it's beneficial ultimately to them to moving the money faster, right? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, the, the ACOs are very focused on uh, getting contracts registered as quickly as possible. That I, can, that I can promise you. And so one of the things that they do is they'll, uh, they'll alert them to the, to, to the need to file their disclosures in Passport, and they won't even need us to do any type of marketing around the system. So do you see a point where where you're going to make this mandatory so uh, as to require it, um, that, that if you are not in Passport, you know, you, there's no longer pen and paper on this. If you're not in Passport, you know, uh, our money is shut to you? So requirement, is, is, that's, a, that's a tricky word, right? Uh, because we certainly want that. Requiring it by law might be something different and maybe something we have to come to you guys for so, uh, in, the, in the future. Um, but essentially we would, in, in a future state, in a perfect world, if you, want, if you want procurements to not require something like the returnable grant fund in the future, then I think you need to, ha you need to have some requirement that vendors are in the system. That's certainly been done with Accelerator. Um, right now, RFPs are issued through Accelerator. There, are, there's no, there hasn't been any resistance or a requirement for paper processes at all from the vendor community, and so I don't, I don't expect any challenges there. Um, back up to the 8,500 uh, vendors who have created the system. How many have not? Do you have like a kind of number of how how many vendors are there? Uh, yeah, so uh, like I said before, um, the, the number fluctuates day, uh, all the time, but I would say that at any given time, ten, about 10,000 vendors have active contracts with the city. Um, and so not all 8,500 are vendors that have contracts with the city. I can get you that breakdown if, if you're interested. Um, but you know, it, the, the target for those with contracts with the city is about 10,000, and we think the outer bound um, is about 20,000. So, I mean, if the target is 10,000, 8,500 have accounts already and 5,700 have successfully filed, so maybe about half have, you know, are either registered but haven't filed or just have, or haven't registered at all. Is that? Yeah, I'm, so we're not too worried about the vendors who have contracts with the city that will uh, come up with uh, contract action. So if a contract is renewed, 
um, or extended, they might have to, they would typically have to file their, their Vendex in the old way of doing things. We're not concerned about them coming to the system. They will come as they need to. Um, agencies, agencies will alert them to it, as will we. Um, what we're focused on, um, just from a, a marketing point of view, is reaching the vendors who have, uh, in the past, uh, not done business with the city, although we would be interested in them being, um, uh, you, know, you know, being competitive with other vendors that we have. We want to reach the vendors who sort of look at the city procurement process and say, no, thank you. Right? We're, we're trying to level the playing field here, demystify city government, and allow a simple process that, can, that is very accessible to small nonprofits, to MWBEs, um, and, and vendors that are, you know, typically have trouble um, uh, engaging with the city um, because of the arduous process that okay, it, so it has been. So obviously that's that's very important. I mean, we obviously we don't want uh, uh, companies that are in the city of New York to say that it's not worth doing business with the city of New York. That's right. um, there's a great benefit to us using our tax dollars uh, locally um, and with our own people. Um, there, you know, as Councilmember Barron indicated earlier, you know, the council and Councilmember Rosenthal indicated, the council has, uh, has, you know, this kind of hybrid concern when it comes to contracts. On the one hand, obviously, there's the million, two million, twenty million dollar contracts, and you're not loaning money out on those. Um, and then there's these tiny five thousand dollar contracts for Little League, and, you know, those are, I'm not going to say more important to the council, but those are the ones where you actually hear from, you know, the vendor who says, I, I just don't have the money. Um, so. You know, when it comes to procurement, then again, I, I recognize the, the place where you are is you're not here about procurement per se, but you hear about this kind of parallel place where, where it's not really procurement, not really registration, not really, but the money's there and it's getting moved out. And we're trying to figure out how, um, as uh, the chair indicated earlier, you know, does this at some point shut down? Wouldn't that be great? Because the whole idea is to move procurement to the place where you don't need a bridge and you don't need this this, uh, you know, rubber band paper clips to kind of keep everything together. Um, just a, a few more questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, are there any contracts or any types of contracts that are simply ineligible for a loan uh, and leaving aside the, the you know, the multi-year, three-year contracts where there's an advance involved and things like that, but, um, you know, new contracts. Are there any like that? So essentially eligibility is, is based on it being for human services. Um, and, a, and a contract pending. Okay. That, that's o essentially only human services contracts. That's right. Okay. Yeah, fine. we're not issuing loans for construction or technology or anything like that. This is for, this is essentially in support of the nonprofit sector um, and for human services. That's it. Okay. That's right. And I guess this is a, it's something I jotted as you were talking, and I'm you know as you mentioned passport, uh, and, you know some of us who have run for things we've we've seen uh, some agencies create these uh, technological things that claim that things happen faster because we have this technological wizardry now. But do you have an indication, if you're able, and you may not be able to, but do you have an indication of how much quicker the implementation uh, of Passport has resulted in payments to vendors, kind of like, you know, a 10 days earlier, 20 days, six months earlier? Do you have any kind of? So with Passport, we've only launched in August. Okay. And so, and, and it's only right now managing that, uh, that disclose, the filing of disclosures. Um, and so I think it's premature to um, sort of report out on any kind of quickness or how, how it's uh, at all relevant to the, the payment processes it's for It's not vendors. really taking in the billing and the, the invoicing right. information. That's right. And how quickly do you believe that that's going to be up and running? So the, the phase two and phase three of Passport, we would expect to roll out over the next two Can years. Can you briefly describe phase two and phase three? Because phase three is completion, right? Sure. Well, it, it, they actually have two, there's two distinct components, although they're all connected. Um, the, the Vendex piece um, is the first sort of account management, establishing the vendor's profile of which everything else was sort of built on, on top of. Um, release two will be focused a lot on um, the city's requirements contracts. Um, that DCAS, that agencies like DCAS and, and Do It hold, um, and the ability to buy off of them uh, at, a, at a much quicker rate. Um, and so uh, right now there's a, an antiquated web of some internal systems that manage this work, um, but it, uh, this, is, this would be, you could think of it as a sort of an Amazon for uh, city procurement 
uh, in a sense, where you've got your, your office supply contract on a catalog online that city agencies are able to buy off of. That exists in, in patches in the, in the city right now. This would be a replacement of those legacy systems. And release three would be the end-to-end -end procurement process, meaning uh, from uh, bid or RFP, what, or whatever the procurement method that is used, all the way through contract registration, and then post-contract registration, doing renewals, amendments, and any other contract actions okay, that so would result from that. Phase two doesn't take in the Little League guy, right? Uh, no, not necessarily, no. So that's phase three. And what, do you have anticipated dates of launch? Uh, I wouldn't call them dates at this point. Right now, they're sort of phased okay, the over the next two of, years. What, I'm sorry? Over the next two years, the next release two, years. two and release three okay. would launch. Um, the, when, you, uh, when, you, when you have the smaller, you know, the, 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 the Little League, and I'm not actually sure I even fund the Little League. I'm not sure why I'm using that. <laughs> Councilmember Brandon probably funds I live across League. the street from East Shore Little League on Staten Island, there and they go. get okay. a council so grant. It's near and dear to your heart. Yes. Um, when you have the Little League and, and they get that contract for the first time and they get it in the Schedule C and now it's, yeah. you know, they find out late June uh, and now it's July. And to the extent that you're able to talk about this, and I don't know if you are, they obviously can't get any funds until the contract's registered, no question. They can't get any funds until they do their billing, which they can't submit electronically at the present moment, correct? They uh, can. They can? Yes. Okay, but not through Passport. Through Accelerator. Through Accelerator, okay. And then at that point, after registration, which takes a bit of time, after submission of invoicing, which takes a bit of time, you have a kind of window-ish guesstimate of when those smaller contracts are getting their, are seeing their first reimbursements. So I, th I, you know, I there's a, it runs the gamut. Um, I've, I worked in, discre when I, sp I spent about a decade at the Department of Youth and Community Development, I was, uh, at the end of that tenure there, agency chief contracting officer. They have the largest volume of discretionary contracts they have We're sorry. in the Little Leagues. <laughs> um, and, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's not just on the city agency to get that process completed, I would say. Of course. Right? Um, there, are, there are certain challenges that, the, you know, the vendors have. The folks at the Little League are not necessarily well-versed in contracts and putting together the documentation that's required to, to get that contract registered. Well, it's, it's no fault of their own. They're trying to run a Little League. Um, and that's what we're focused on. What we're focused on is bringing the accessibility to them through, uh, you know, an online interface, um, and also trying to demystify uh, a lot of what the city does in the procurement process. So th that, that's what we're focused on. To, to prov I'm not trying to dodge the, the, the question about timing, cool. but it, it's really dependent on multiple factors. Um, but, I, you know, I've seen con discretionary contracts get registered in August. Um, you know, it, it's much more about will than it is process sometimes. Um, but on average, I would say it takes uh, a few to okay. several I months. apologize. I, and I know I took us into the woods on the, on the procurement thing, and we're really here about the loan fund, but I appreciate uh, And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilman Perkins. Thank you. So um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, this, I'm, uh, you have uh, uh, 751 loans that um, have been uh, procured, processed for 2017. Uh, am I correct? That's yeah. correct. So, so can you give us sort of a, like, is this a high point or have we been processing more in the past or how are we proceeding? How are we growing? Is this number growing? I would say yes, the number of loans and the amount of funding loaned out has increased, and I would say that that is um, uh, in lockstep with the investment that this administration has made in human ser services more generally. So as the, as, the, as the amount of funding that is procured for human services has gone up, we've seen the use of the loan fund go up. Okay. And is there, from your understanding, sort of a, a conscientious plan to move this up higher and higher with some goal in mind? So we don't have a goal for this amount to be higher at this point. Um, we, at, at this moment, we don't, you know, we, there's enough availability of funding, and so we don't see the, the amount of funding going up at this point. 
But but we've we, but, but in the past in the past we have res, you know we've responded and expressed that need if we saw that it was prudent um, and we wouldn't and but, we wouldn't hesitate. But the assumption that you're saying, which might may be incorrect, that you have enough uh, to support your goals as per what you ba have. Yeah, based on the applications that we see coming in and the availability of funds that we have now, we believe it, it is is adequate. And so at, in that adequacy, what would you uh, estimate the total number would be in, in the course of, what, in the pattern that you're presently going? So procurement is very cyclical, so it's, it's you know, there'll be times in the year, contracts, you know, uh, it, you know begin and expire all the time, um, and so it's constantly fluctuating. Um, you know, around the turn of the fiscal year, in the May, June, July uh, time frame, you'll see uh, heavier usage sometimes because a lot of contracts begin on July 1st, and so you might see an uptick in, in, in loan application activity. Mm -hmm. um, but that, uh, you know, as I said before, we, we, don't see, um, we don't see a need to increase the fund at this point. And do you have a, an NWBE, Minority Business, perspective on this in terms of uh, reaching out particularly to those types of uh, folks that need that support? Well, uh, this loan fund is, is uh, uh, for human services mm -hmm. where MWB wouldn't apply. Um, but I can say that, uh, you know, the small nonprofits are folks that we are very heavily focused on. Um, as other members have said, we're not too concerned about the large nonprofits. They sort of, they understand what they need to do. They have the capacity um, to um, either uh, provide, uh, you know, their own, you know, they, can, they can float the, the delay in the contract registration potentially, and so they don't typically come to us for loans. This really is about supporting the smaller nonprofits that, that are operating on the margins and could not afford to operate the program without the loan in place, and that's what so we're focused assuming on. Assuming that's the case, what is the MWBE participation in that? So there, there are no MWBEs that we would issue loans to because this is for human services. Well, in, even in the human services arena, I mean. There are human services organizations that right. are very focused and very much. So, so generally, the city's MWBE program uh, right now, its current iteration is in Local Law 1 of 2013, which is, which is in the admin code. Um, and it, it has certain exclusions that apply, and one of those being human services. And that's the result of the disparity study that was conducted uh, that showed where the disparity was in the various industries that uh, demonstrated disparity for the city's program. But I think the overarching reason is it, the majority of, of uh, entities that engage in this area, the human services area, are nonprofits, and there is no ownership of a nonprofit, and so one of the criteria for being an MWBE is you have to demonstrate 51% ownership by either a woman or minority-owned business. So they, they, by definition, don't operate in this space. Not that there aren't some that could, but by and large, that they're just not a part of the human services uh, segment. So then, those that are non-for-profits, right, that are not enterprises, where are we at with that group that are specifically serving communities? of the type that would under enterprise be serving them in this way. You understand what I'm saying? Sure, I think, so that's information that I think we can get back to you with. You're saying which of the nonprofits that serve various communities, uh, how much are they Especially utilizing the loan fund, color. I think. Sure, sure, I, I think that that's information that we can try to come back to you with uh, the various types of nonprofits that may be serving communities of color. Right, and you do have some of that type that fit that sort of description? Yeah, I mean, there, there's no, there's nothing that uh, there's no, there are no parameters around the types of nonprofit organizations that can apply for a loan under the fund. Um, you know, it would be a matter of, I guess, providing you the information uh, in that in that way. So the so the 10,000 vendors that, that somebody mentioned earlier with contracts, are, uh, there's none that might be in that kind of descriptive measure that particularly focus on communities of color. And have those kinds of uh, Big operations. Uh, so, Council Member, I think so. The as I'm understanding the question, um, what you're interested in here is: Are loan funds available to organizations that are serving communities of color? 
Um, and the answer obviously is yes. This is for nonprofits. They're ser serving the neediest communities across various services. Um, the one, the if you're talking about the specific agencies, like sure, the Urban League and NAACP that take those type of descriptions. Sure. So separating out the the loan fund itself from uh, the ten thousand we were talking about, I think was with Passport, um, and thinking about the number of organizations that we're looking to make sure are registered in Passport specifically um, and are able to take advantage of an online process where they file their disclosures, we can absolutely get back to you about the, how many of those are MWBEs uh, based on the description that our council gave. Thank you. Um, if an entity doesn't use uh, the RGF and they go and they get a private bridge loan, then the city reimburses them? Uh, the city, in, in that context, no. The city would only have the con contractual relationship uh, uh, based, on, you know, based on the contract that ultimately gets registered. I mean, how often do you see that happening? Uh, I mean, we don't, so we, if, if, a, if a nonprofit were to go out and get the secure loan from a bank, that's not something we would necessarily be aware of. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm sort of, I'm in, I'm in the column of the, the RGF is sort of a barometer of the glacial pace of procurement, right? Like, I think if you have, you got entities that rarely, if ever, default, and like, like my colleague uh, Councilman Yeager was saying, if they're basically qualified to get a check from the city, it's, you know, it's six in one, half dozen in the other, really. If they're qualified enough for us to float them money, then aren't they qualified enough just to get the contract at that point? So I think if we're, you know, with Passport 2 and 3 and everything that we're doing to sort of, I would hope, is that we're trying to, it's a good thing to try to make this fund obsolete because it would, right now, for instance, right now, how long is the approximate wait time that, that someone, uh, an entity gets a bridge loan before they actually receive, then they receive the, the uh, contract? Uh, so, the, so the target is 90 days. I would say uh, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me on, on so the length of time, but it, but we sort of three months. Yeah, what we're what we're looking for, Mox, is because we want the contract to be registered fairly quickly so that the loan fund can get replenished again. And so we're we're always looking for you know what does the agency estimate as the time it will take to get the contract registered? And 90 days is sort of just a you know a, an aspirational I mean, I target. I think 90 days is is like surmountable, right? Like if you said it was two years or three years, that's a whole different ball game. But 90 days seems like we tighten up a couple of things and... I wish it was a couple of things. Um, I think it's a lot more than a couple of things. Um, but... Uh, I guess it, that's the problem. Yes, absolutely. Like when you showed me that schematic, I wanted to break down in tears. Yeah. Um, that's us every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's that's where I am. I mean, I think you know, I think it's obviously a great thing for for the providers because you know they got to keep their lights on, and I think it's great that the city offers this. But for me, it's always going to be an indicator of how long you know. It's it's just a monument for how long this process takes. That we have to float someone money for ninety days. We can't you know sort of connect those two pieces or or million pieces, whatever it is. Um, so. And I even think you know you've you've guys admitted and, and agree with us that the, the procurement process is flawed. Um, but do, do you see that 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 making the RGF obsolete? Do you agree that making it obsolete would be a victory? If 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 it was rendered obsolete, yes, we, uh, you know we would then be on the Mount Rushmore of procurement. Okay. Um, I just I just cannot imagine that it you know it getting. Uh, you, there, are, there are all sorts of reasons. Even, even in a, if, if we do a bang up job of producing passport and it does everything we want it to do, there are also some non process issues that delay contract registration, negotiations. Um, there, you know, it, it, we can go on and on, but you know, there are some things that a technology, a, p a piece of technology, will not, will, will not fix. There are certain business processes and oversight. Um, approvals that uh, a technology will not be able to fix. So I don't. I just don't want to sort of uh, 
I want to manage expectations. I think the, the loan fund is important for the nonprofit sector. We strive to make it obsolete, absolutely, um, but I, I just wouldn't be prepared to say that that is, uh, that is in the cards at this moment. Um, last couple of things. What, what, what sort of assistance or technical assistance is available through MOCs or other city agencies to uh, help nonprofits sort of learn about this this bureaucratic uh, safari that we're, we have to uh, find our way through. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think in response to Councilmember Barron's question, um, MOX continues to work really closely with the city agencies um, through a number of methods. So each of the agency chief contracting officers and their teams have access to centralized training through what's called a Procurement Training Institute. Um, we have monthly meetings with them uh, to make sure that um, not only are they trained up front and ongoing, but we're also in communicating what um, key policies, messages, protocols, things that need to be tweaked along the way in terms of practice, that is our venue for working with them. Um, agencies uh, it, at the same time are constantly meeting with their uh, vendor vendors, right? So um, whether it's uh, at an award stage and they bring folks in to tell them what the process is to get a contract and to hold that contract with the city agency, or it's ongoing provider trainings that they have usually organized by portfolio, right? So um, I'm thinking of an organization like DYCD uh, that each each group, the SYP uh, folks would bring their, their teams in and that those folks would have training. Um, their chief contracting officer usually has capacity building and they have a dedicated technical assistance program. Other agencies have similar setups, whether you're looking at DIFTA or the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, on a central basis, specific to discretionary, I, I mentioned earlier that um, you know, with your, your council finance team, um, we host uh, quarter, uh, what used to be quarterly, it's now three times a year, uh, in-person trainings for folks who are looking to come into the discretionary portfolio. So this is where um, you know, I think it's important to find a lot of those organizations that are uh, delivering services to the most needy, enriching programs as well in terms of cultural programming and the little leagues and so on. Um, for us, that's a great opportunity for especially the newcomers. We find that it's very common for an organization that's doing business with the city. The discretionary is often a, a gateway in uh, to, to f then competing f through RFPs. So that's one place where we partner closely with council to make sure that they're aware um, of what it means to hold a contract. We bring in agencies, uh, other agencies like DOI. We bring in capacity building uh, technical assistance providers to talk about what it means to manage an organization, what it means to have board oversight and governance. Um, again, holding a city contract and the basics of that. And then we, of course, tell them about the loan fund um, and other th tools to keep them strong and keep their doors open. So there are a number of different venues, but I think we, we are the central entity that supports the agencies in administering. Um, through our, uh, 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 Director Simon talked uh, about uh, the strengthening non uh, the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee earlier. Um, that's another place where we're working to think about the practices and policies we need to put in place. So there, that group is birthing a lot of new, uh, new initiatives that we then roll out, whether it's additional trainings or it's policies that we spit back out into the, to, uh, the agencies or the sector. So there are a number of different venues, uh, but we tend to take on the central coordinating role, um, and then the agencies have a lot of different practices that they put in place. And in addition to that, I would say that one of the things that, um, that makes Accelerator a success is really just the transparency. It's not that vendors really need to understand how the city agency is doing their job, but just to understand where my budget is, where my proposal is. And a system that is being shared by both the city and the vendor at the same time with statuses uh, and, and dates of activities available um, at, at their fingertips, that I think is what uh, promotes a lot of goodwill amongst the, the nonprofit sector, but then, you know, there, there isn't uh, so much mystery about what's going on because you can see it. And, you know, sunlight uh, provides a lot of efficiency, uh, it's particularly in the nonprofit sector. How, how long has the fund been around, RGF? 1992. Okay. And it was created, like, w w what happened? There was some emergency, or you were hearing it a lot, or? Uh, so, 
according to what we have from uh, uh, 1992, it was in response to a need for the summer youth employment program. Oh, okay. That's right, about okay. the extent of the history that we're aware of. Okay. Okay. Councilman Perkins, do you have anything else? Okay. All right. I think uh, the RGF lives to fight another day. Um, thank you guys very much. Thank you. What do I say now? This hearing's adjourned.